for joining us today. Um, so this is, I'm really excited about this topic. We have a, a couple of great guests um, and uh, I just wanted to uh, it, quickly introduce you to our panel today and then, um, and then we'll dive right in. So if you could go to the next slide. Yes, today we're joined by Ali Santori, who's the SVP of Government Affairs for Providence. And we'll have you introduce yourself a little bit in a, a little bit later. And then um, we're also excited to have Tappan Vic Vickery, who is the um, who is with the organization called Headcount, who this is an extremely busy time for, and we're just so glad that you could make time for us. Um, and before we get started, I do have to um, share the disclaimer that this video is for informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice. So if you have medical questions, please um, talk to your physician or other qualified health provider. So um, why don't we go ahead and dive right in. And um, I'm gonna start with Ali. Um, we'd love for you to just introduce yourself so that um, our audience knows who you are and talk a little bit about the work that you do for Providence. Sure, absolutely, Thanks, Melissa. So excited today to talk about our Vote for Health campaign. So I serve as the leader of government and public affairs and social responsibility for the Providence system. So that means overseeing our relationship with state and federal governments across our seven states and in Washington, DC. Um, another part of that, aside from the external component of dealing with external stakeholders is working internally with our caregivers, which is what we call employees at Providence to ensure that they are informed of important information, uh, information policy decisions, um, impact of government operations, which has been especially important during COVID. So it's both an internal and an external role in helping to influence policy and then help our organization understand the impacts of that policy. Great, thanks, Ali. So tap in, um, tell us about yourself and, and especially about the work that Headcount does. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Tappan Vickery and I'm the Director of Voter Engagement for Headcount. And we are a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit that works to connect voters to voter registration and voter information and turn out the vote. We traditionally do that by working with artists and influencers through um, broad-based media campaigns and also by registering voters at concerts and community events and cultural events. Um, trying to find the intersection of where people are kind of opened up and to have these conversations um, and bringing it to them in a very deliberate and um, nonpartisan way. We find that um, we're able to reach people that campaigns miss because that's how we deliver our message. We really empower people to make their own choices and to look at the issues to become engaged voters. Um, and we're very excited to be here today. This has been a crazy year for us because we haven't had our field outreach, at least not in the way that we're used to, but because of great opportunities like this um, this afternoon and great partners, um, both from brands and corporations and our artists, we've still been able to reach a lot of people. So I really appreciate being here. Tappan, can you um, talk a little bit, you've been doing this for a really long time. Can you talk a little bit about how this year is different than other years that you've um, done this type of work? Absolutely. So. First of all, the fact that we're not in the field is very different. But what is also different is that um, when the pandemic hit in March, or when we decided to acknowledge the pandemic in March, we um, realized in the middle of our primary season that we did not have a pandemic-proof democracy. And all of a sudden, people were facing the choice between going to be heard at the polls and cast their vote and keep themselves safe and follow the guidelines that have been put forth through the quarantine. And every state runs their own election system, and every state has a different process for people to vote outside of election day, whether that's in early voting or during um, vote by mail or in-person absentee or what's called mail-in voting. And because of the distinction, there's no universal way for us to communicate what is happening. You really have to be dialed into what's happening at the state level. And so for us, it's been a lot of mobilization around hyper-local election issues and communication around those to make sure that people have the information that they need to make their vote count. And it's an interesting bridge because we know that voter participation goes down a lot during local election years. Like, you know, in 2016, we had 56% participation. In a local election, you're doing really well if you get 20%. 
And now all of a sudden people are paying a lot of attention to their local policymakers and a lot of attention to how they can access government. So it's really showing a lot of the power of local government and um, the bridge between access to being heard and who your policymakers are. So is 56% nationally and 20% locally, is that success for this year or what? what is your... I, I never consider that to be success. I mean, what's great about our country is people have freedom of choice. And so some people choose not to vote and some people choose not to be registered. And I respect that because they have that freedom. I would sincerely hope that our participation rates go up significantly um, because we can only have equal representation when all the different demographics of our country are represented at the polls and they elect leaders that represent everyone's interest. We have the most diverse voting electorate in the history of our country this year, with one third identifying as being non-white. And because of that, we have more opportunity to see diversity during the election process than we ever have before. And within that, Gen Z is really cool. Gen Z, which we define as 18 to 24 year olds, 45% of them identify as being non-white. And one in 10 Americans of all ages this year was not born in the United States of America that's eligible to vote. So one in 10 eligible voters is um, from another country or started in another country and is home here now. So, you know, we have this incredible range of diversity, but we also have a lot of barriers and a lot of procedural barriers that keep people from voting. And so it's my sincere hope that with through campaigns like ours, we have right now it's called a uh, Make Your Vote Count campaign where we really break down the different ways you can vote and all the ways that your vote could be challenged through each state and through communication um, like this event, we're able to really connect people to the information that they need to be empowered, to be heard, um, and that our participation rates go way up. Great, thank you. Those are just super interesting stats. And um, I think it's a really good segue into the work that you're doing, Allie. Um, so you and Providence have launched the Vote for Health campaign. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and why Providence getting involved in this? Sure, and I still appreciate the work that Tuffin is leading as well. And, and she used the phrase, ease the way of voters. And at Providence, and Melissa, you know we have a promise Called that we say, know, know me, care for me, ease my way for our patients in our community. And so we translate that, that generally refers to patient care and experience within our hospitals, but we translate that to civic engagement. So we're also trying to ease the way for our patients and our caregivers with the Vote for Health campaign. Also a really important issue that Tappan hit on as well is that is the um, disparities in terms of processes and um, how and where to vote across our states. So the Vote for Health campaign really has three primary uh, pillars to it. The first is a robust voter registration drive to get people registered to vote. Uh, it's targeted at the 18 to 35 year old demographic, which make up about a third of the uh, voting population. But many of those uh, folks don't vote because of various barriers, but one of those being lack of registration or a, a registration that's not up to date. So we have a significant voter registration drive. Um, we also have information on what makes every individual vote important. At Providence, we believe that every voice matters every vote counts. And so no matter where you live, uh, whether or not, you know, the national election is going to go one way or another. I live in California. There's not a lot of suspense around where the national election is going to go in California. But that doesn't mean that my vote is any less important than a voter in a swing state. So Tobin talked about the importance of these local elections and the policy decisions that these local leaders are tasked with making have a real impact on our communities, on our neighbors, on our families. So the second pillar of the vote, the vote for Health campaign is around education, around what's at stake in each state that we have a, a footprint in for Providence. And then the third pillar is actual get out the vote opportunities. We're doing some really exciting things to specifically ease the way of our patients and caregivers. Um, and one of those is an example is uh, bringing polling vans to our hospitals uh, in LA County. So our physicians, nurses, clinicians can actually vote on site. Um, so those are the three primary pillars of the Vote for Health campaign. And we're really trying to encourage our patients, our caregivers and the communities that we serve to really take the opportunity to use all of this passion 
and anxiety that people are feeling and channel those feelings into action. Um, that's, that's great. It's such a, it's such a, such a cool campaign and I'm really glad that you're um, leading this effort for Providence. Um, so one question I have for you, um, because both of your organizations are bipartisan, is it hard to stay bipartisan when you're doing this type of campaign? How do you, um, how do you demonstrate that this is not, you're not pushing for one um, candidate or another, or one party or another? Can you talk, talk a little bit about that? And I can start with you, Tappan. That's always the hardest question, right? Um, because we all have our own personal opinions, but I'll tell you, ad counts driving force since we have started is that democracy is better because of participation. And we are a ground up organization. We did not have staff for a very long time. We started off as being volunteer based and we continue to have volunteers that are from every walk of political life. And it keeps us very honest to our mission because we believe in democracy. And if you believe in democracy, it's easy to stay nonpartisan because if one set of ideals is making all of the decisions, then you've stopped growing as a country and you've stopped challenging yourself to be better. So because we believe in democracy and the democratic process, and that's represented both with our artists and our volunteers, it's been, it's pretty easy. Now, are there people out there who want to pin me or pin us one way or the other? Of course, but in our core values and we know who we are and we know what we're doing is right. Um, and so there's never a challenge that I'm afraid afraid of <laughs> because I know that we're we're truly nonpartisan through and through. Can you talk a little bit about it, Allie? Yeah, I would say that the, uh, at the foundational level, the Vote for Health campaign is about individual empowerment. So it's really about encouraging individuals to make a plan for themselves and to understand how to access avenues to participate in democracy, in, in the process. Uh, I so agree that participation is fundamental to democracy. Diversity of thought and opinion are also fundamental to democracy. And so the campaign is truly about each individual making a plan for themselves to express uh, through civic engagement what's important to them. Great. Um, so Another question for you has to do with health. What does health have to do with voting? How do you make that connection? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll start and talk about that. Um, you know, public policy has a tremendous impact on the health of individuals and the health of our community. That's everything from health, access to healthcare services via health insurance coverage, the availability and affordability of health, of health insurance coverage, and also the health in a broader context, those social determinants of health, like access to safe and affordable housing, um, access to clean water, um, you know, the health of our planet. It is something else that we also consider at Providence as important to us. Um, you know, our, our vision is health for a better world, and that encompasses all different kinds of health, and all of the classes of health are impacted at the ballot box. They're impacted by policy decisions that elected leaders make. So we really want people to understand and take a holistic pro approach to how they're going to vote and to really understand the impact that their vote has on the health of themselves and the health of their communities. Sorry, just trying to unmute. Um, Tappan, can you talk a little bit about uh, the connection that you see between health and voting? Absolutely. Um, well, like many of us in the world, I am um, beginning to have aging parents and I have children. So in both of these intersections, more so than I think I ever saw in my personal life, um, I see the impact of both public health, health and policy decisions that are surround environmental justice and public health justice um, happening about clean water and access to safe buildings and things along those lines. Um, and then also, you know, as my parents and in-laws are transitioning into another phase of life, I'm realizing the incredible impact of having ex access to public support and programs for them in their next phases. And, you know, I think for us um, at Headcount, 
We have also run campaigns where we're trying to help the artist community and musicians connect with resources to get health insurance. A lot of them are not, you know, they're independent independent contractors that even that would be <laughs> for many or street musicians and making sure that they have coverage and have access is something that we've worked on as well. And I think that anytime the health of our nation is like in front of us, like we know that it's a tiered situation where we do better as a country if we have policies that support good public health. And our policies come from our local policymakers who are protecting the watershed that our children drink from all the way up the line. And so there's there's a very clear correlation between the two for us. Yeah, and I see that we have a comment here just saying that it's it's great. It's great that Headcount works with the entertainment industry. So that's a really interesting connection. Um, so you have a campaign called The Future is Voting. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Sure. Well, this goes directly towards what I believe is a public health issue. Um, we started the Future is Voting campaign in 2018 and the ramp up to this year, and it was inspired by what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas um, in the Parkland shooting. And at that moment, uh, there was a call to action from students there that said, go pre-register to vote. <laughs> and it was tremendous. And then we supported um, that their campaign to simply register voters without a stance on any particular issue. And since then, we've been really um, targeting 18-year-olds, 16-year-olds um, in states where we can, and really making sure that we are giving very young people information they need to vote. You know, it was 1971 when 18 to, um, to 20 year olds were given the right to vote. And because that was a, the last group of people that received the right to vote um, nationally, there has been a lack of um, support. Some states have actually prohibited teachers from talking about this in the classroom. And so there are other states that have been very progressive and start re-registering people at 16, like California. Um, and so we have worked really hard to engage that very young, very first time voter to make sure that they're empowered with the information that they need and that they know that their, their vote matters. And we have seen an increase in turnout. We saw it in 2018. Um, and I believe that we will see it again um, this year where we're seeing those 18 to 19 year olds really step up for their first election and show that they are going to be voters. And once somebody votes for the first time, they'll be voters for most of the rest of their life. And so it's that first election where you want to find someone and give them their voice. And we do believe, as I mentioned earlier, with our statistics and everything else, that we do believe that this voting block will define who we are as a country if we listen. And so in the only way we're going to, I say you can't show up, you can't be the boss if you don't show up. And so our democracy is ours. So we just all have to show up and, and be the boss. Yeah, I mean, what are you doing to reach that younger population? And what do you think is going to make the difference that actually gets them out to vote? Right. So we have, a, we're doing everything we can, anything we can do. But mostly we're working with um, partners and artists. Um, we've worked really closely with Ariana Grande, with Billie Eilish. Um, we've worked with Cardi B this year, like really trying to target um, today, like the very, the artists that are reaching the youngest um, voters. Um, and we ask them to simply ask people, hey, will you register to vote? That 62% of eligible Americans say that no one has ever asked them to register. And that's why they don't participate. So we do that through video and social media. We also do it through direct email. We're also becoming a part, uh, integrated into apps. Um, last week for National Voter Registration Day, if you're on Spotify, you may have gotten our pop-up inviting you to register to vote and went to every Spotify user in the United States who's over the age of 18. Um, we are working with brand partners like American Eagle to really get out there um, that target youth voters and work very closely with them. Every receipt from American Eagle has our information on it right now. So really putting ourselves in front of young voters um, as visibly as we can with culture. We know that campaigns do not reach out to young voters. They're not the people who are getting the text messages and everything else that the three of us might be getting um, because they're not the low hanging fruit and the campaigns want to demonstrate that they've had higher impact. And so we are reaching them. We have a 
Are you saying it? Just based on your title that you're older than 24. <laughs> Maybe though. <laughs> Forgive me. But yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, you know, we're we're getting out there every way we can. And it is um it's working. It is definitely working. I don't know if you guys saw um, National Voter Registration Day, which is a coalition-based effort that Riz last Tuesday um, had its record year with 1.5 million people registering. It's amazing. It's tremendous. Um, so we're we're bridging the gap, you guys. We really are bridging the gap. I and it and it's ongoing. It doesn't stop. Um, and some of the questions, and I will say this, and I know I'm probably taking too much time on this, but um, people are embarrassed to let you know if they have very simple questions about voting. So if you have a person in your life who's not really talking about it, most likely they're nervous about asking questions like, what ID do I really need to have? Nobody wants to walk into that situation yeah. and feel like they're going to make a mistake. It's embarrassing. And I think we, a lot of us can identify with that. Um, so being an ally to your friends, if you are a confident voter, is something that can really make a difference and being a resource for them. Um, yeah, that's such a great point um, that that people do have really basic questions and just um, this is a situation where there are no dumb questions, partly because the, the rules change all the time in different states. So. Um, there so are really rules that have changed within the past two weeks and gone yeah. back in states right now. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's a great point. Um, Allie, I know that the younger voting block is also one of the target audiences for the Vote for Health campaign. What are you doing to reach out to that audience and how, how important are they um, to health and healthcare issues? Uh, I mean, they're incredibly important. And so I, I still desire all the work that Headcount is doing uh, to reach out to that younger voting block. We have used our um, our healthcare platforms uh, and our interactions with patients to reach out and encourage them to vote. So in many of our emergency departments, we attach a, a, a card for people to register to vote to patient visit summaries. So that's already reached tens of thousands of patients across the Seattle area and in Portland. Uh, we have also uh, partnered with influencers on social media, with NBA players, and talking about and formulated a campaign around my why, why I vote, because voting is very personal. Like I said, this is in, about individual empowerment, um, and it should be personal. And so we've uh, engaged influencers across the entertainment industry and uh, the sports industries to talk about their why, why they vote, and encourage these younger voters to vote as well. Great. Um, so one of the before we got started today, one of the terms that you used happened was that we are not a pandemic proof democracy. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, you guys are actually in some of the states that did show themselves to be pandemic proof, which meant that voters, registered voters, all had equal access to the polls built into their system through a vote by mail system. So the states that already had established vote by mail, which includes Oregon and Washington, Utah, um, Hawaii, and Colorado, um, those states were already, they were not affected by the pandemic. Every other state in the country has scrambled to figure out how to make sure that people don't have to choose between their health, and for some people, their life, and voting. So California was able to pivot pretty quickly to doing vote by mail because many counties had already pivoted to it. Um, there, you know, I'm sure you guys tracked that there were challenges to that in the court uh, anyway. And there are other states where they have tried to mail ballots to people or mail ballot requests to people. But at the end of the day, if voters are not used to voting by mail, there is a tremendous margin for error. Over half a million ballots that were sent by mail were rejected in the 2020 primary season. Half a million. In 2016, it was only 1% of voters or votes that were submitted by mail. So that's because people who are, and traditionally the ballots that are rejected and this year is no different, were from young voters and were from voters of color. 
And that's because they did not read the very complicated instructions and make sure that they followed them to the T. They made mistakes, they mailed them in late, they didn't have witness signatures, they didn't sign in ink as opposed to pencil. Stuff that you might not think about, but those little things, your ballot will get tossed. Another huge thing is if your signature doesn't match your voter registration record or your DMV record, depending on how you registered. So because of this, we've seen that people were more people were disenfranchised by voting by mail than ever before. They were also disenfranchised by the pandemic because they did not feel that they could go to the polls safely. And you saw that everyone saw the pictures in Wisconsin of people, you know, they standing in line in the middle of the pandemic. Um, same thing in Georgia. There were just terrible images of people that really scare them. Um, and scare them away from the process. And one of the biggest forms of disenfranchisement that we have, people not believing in our process. And the pandemic has made that worse. And the media has made that worse around the pandemic as well. Yeah, I mean, I would love to just get to some logistics to help people um, plan um, or understand like what kind of the next steps are. But so what you were saying is that we're um, registration deadlines are coming up like this Sunday. So you're gonna be moving into the um, Get. Yeah, so no yes. matter what state you're in right now, you can go to headcount.org slash make your vote count, and it will go through every single one of those little things that I just mentioned. Um, and that should be your next move after you make sure you're registered. Okay. And then, um, so what are the ways that people can vote? Is I mean, it's basically mail and in person. Right, so you can vote early. In every state in the United States, except for Mississippi, you can vote early, early without an excuse. Now, some states have what's called a real early voting period where there are multiple locations. And there are other states where you might need to go to your county or a local clerk's office to cast a ballot early. So you can do that on your schedule. Um, and the dates are on our website for what your state's access points are or you can request a by mail ballot. We know that the postal service is not working at its best capacity right now. And so if you wanna vote by mail, request your ballot now, and we recommend that you mail it back before the 20th, because we know if you mail it after the 20th, it may not make it back. What's even better is if you can return it in person, and we recommend that you take it to a drop box, and I think there might be drop boxes in all seven of your states, except for Texas. Um, okay. Take it, take it to a Dropbox if you can. And then, of course, you can also vote on Election Day. So early vote is the safest way to do it. And then Election Day and vote by mail, your other options. Um, those are super great tips. Um, and then for people who are doing the vote by mail, how do you how can they make sure that they are getting it right and don't mess up the ballot? They need to slowly read the instructions before they start filling it out. They need to make sure that their signature matches the signature on their ID or their voter registration record. For example, if you were um, an older patient in a hospital and you needed to vote by mail and you had your ID that you signed like 25 years ago, you probably want to make sure that you check your ID or check your voter, like what it used to look like and sign accordingly because your, your signature can change over time. You can also track your ballot and see if there's been a challenge and you will have an opportunity to cure it in many states, not all states, but you need to pick up the phone because somebody from the county clerk's office is going to call you from a strange number and you need to pick it up because you're going to have a short period in which to cure your ballot. Okay, um, last question. I think both of you can answer this and we're going to run out of time here in a moment, but um, so how do, if people do choose to go to the polls, um, if they if they go to the polls, how do they do it safely? Well, I think it's probably a lot of the same things that you guys are doing at the hospital. <laughs> so I will let you, but the, the people who are working the polls will all have complete PPE. It's um, It was paid for by the federal government. So they should all be suited up and we should be able to be there safely, as safely as the grocery store. Um, and then you want to follow the CDC recommendations um, with the, with masking and social distancing. Great. And do you have anything to add, Allie? You know, I would just add in closing that it, it's so important that people understand that their voice matters, that their voice counts. You know, Tavin mentioned a, a defining 
uh, that this is a defining act and it's not a defining moment, you know, or it's not a, a defining fleeting act, but decisions that will be influenced by our votes will be impacting communities for years to come. So you have the power to influence the health of your community for years to come by making sure your vote counts on November 3rd. That's great. And I think that's a great place to leave it. So thank you so much to you both for joining us today for this really um, great conversation. And um, just everyone, uh, deadlines are coming up for registration. So make sure you're, you're registered, um, request your ballot and um, make a plan to vote. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.